<laughs> At least somebody likes me out there. That's great. <laughs> um, just as a kind of a disclaimer, kind of a warning, uh, we were in Canada just a few weeks ago. Uh, I gave a similar talk, a similar teaching to the one you're going to hear right now. This one is more of an amped up, more direct, more, shall we say, illegal, according to the Canadian government. <laughs> Um, this could have cost me 50,000 uh, Canadian dollars just to do this, this topic today. Um, it's entitled, The Gospel According to the World. And there's a lot of things changing. By the way, isn't it nice to be in the United Kingdom, close proximity, no masks, no mandates? Isn't it nice? Look at this. You're all together, all of you. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Did you know that the Bible predicts and has the stories of the tendencies of humanity to want to come together. Uh, the stories of the Tower of Babel and different cities throughout the world, let us make a name great for ourselves. This is something that is an issue that's been going on since antiquity. But there's been a real shift because of technology, because of the Industrial Revolution, because of the last 100 years, where the world has been able to fulfill its dream of coming together in ways which were unprecedented beforehand. We're going to be looking at that today. We're going to be looking at the message that the world has for the world. The good news that the world has engineered, much of which they have robbed from you, the believer, and the Bible reframed it and packaged it in a way that has a sticker tag that no one can disagree with, but has no power to transform the soul. So, we're going to be looking at a series of pictures and verses this morning, uh, and then this afternoon, well, this, later this morning and this afternoon, we're going to be unpacking a lot more to give you the equipping that you need to see clearly in the times that we look at. So I invite you to be a tourist as I'm your tour guide through some scriptures today. I want to put up on the screen the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, and we have the story written in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. This is a story where people were building a, a, a monument to themselves even uh, a place of worship um, to the gods. And they were thanking themselves for what they have been achie achieving. We have been doing this uh, since the inception of time. It says in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, Now the whole world had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And I like this next verse, verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. It's like the Lord sa says, what is that thing? It's like a little, oh, isn't that cute? Like Duplo Lego blocks. Oh, <laughs> he, had to, he had to get down and see. And, and they're thinking, wow, this is the greatest thing. We've built this tower. It's magnificent. Ha, aren't we something? And God had to come down. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. There, there's a line that you pass, and we've seen that. Come, let us go down. I like that. Come, let us. There's your trinity right there. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, Babel. Why? Because in Hebrew, Babel means confusion. Yeah. Le Balbel is to confuse. Bilbul is confusion. And Babel is the whole concept of confusion or melting pot. And they called it Bavel because there the Lord confused the language of all earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. few uh, interesting comments here as I'm your tour guide. 
You have accounts of this Tower of Babel in the ancient Near East text. For example, Enuma Elish, book number 6, lines 55 to 64, talk about a construction of the people of the ancient days around the Babylon area that tried to reach the skies and make a name great for themselves, otherwise known as ziggurat temples. But what's interesting... Since the inception of the Industrial Revolution and technology, which we use, including the internet, cell phones, computers, I have one right here, for every time the world uses it, I want to use it four times more for the gospel. Okay? I invite you to do that along the journey because there's, there's the principle of inevitability here. We know the scriptures predicts that the world will come together in the end. It's going to get what it's always wanted throughout all of time. And I've just given you the first major example in Scripture where we see the one world government. The gospel according to the world would say we need to come together as humanity. We need to share resources. We can't be exclusive. We don't want to be religious or political. We want to take values from every religious system stir them up and confuse them and put on the coexist bumper sticker on everybody's car. Do you have the coexist bumper sticker in England? No. Okay. Well, that, that joke kind of fell off the cliff. <laughs> in the United States, we have this bumper sticker. It says coexist, and it has a crescent representing Islam, has the Star of David representing Judaism, has, has the cross representing Christianity, and it has a few other symbols that represent Buddhism and Hinduism and so on. In other words, the coexist bumper sticker is the world coming together, tolerating each other, but in the end times, not just tolerating, but taking the values of each of these religions and removing the exclusiveness. So the Christian can't say, Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. The Christian actually has to say, Jesus is a valid option within the soup of confusion. Isn't that interesting? Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, we roll ahead the clock many years. This is now under the times of the kings. Why do the nations rage? It's a messianic psalm. Look what the attitude of the world is to the Lord, Adonai, and his Messiah. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. They set themselves. You heard of that kind of phenomena even in today's day and age? And the rulers take counsel together, United Nations, which stands for unnecessary or, or, or well, yeah, united nothing, really. And they come together against the Lord and against his, in the Hebrew it says Mashiach. Mashiach means Messiah. And what do they say? Let us break their bonds in pieces. Let us break God and the Messiah's bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. The world actually looks at God and his Messiah as people that want to put them in bondage. Look at the sleight of hand trick that the devil does to people's minds, even as far back as this, as this was written. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Ah, can you imagine? God, God comes down and he laughs. That's funny. Duplo, you got, by the way, you, you, did, you got it wrong here. Let me fix that here. You know, can you imagine? Um, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Despite all of that, this messianic psalm, verse 6, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. In other words, no matter what humans try to do to make a great name for themselves, there is that. That's, that's inevitable. We know that's coming. We know that they're going to sell that as good news. But the real good news is the coming king who will set himself up on his throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign with a nationalistic kingdom based on the principles of Scripture. And everyone in the world will be able to enjoy the prosperity. Imagine Thousand years of the perfect government with the perfect king. Imagine that. You're a kingdom here. This is the United Kingdom. But imagine the Jesus kingdom. Whew. 
Imagine the economy of Jesus. Imagine the security of Jesus. R- r- what about the educational system under Jesus' rule, okay? How, how about tra- tr- the traffic system under the Jesus method, okay? Can you, can you imagine with me what this is going to look like? Well, Babylon, whether it be the Tower of Babel as the symbol of the one world coming together, is not exclusive to the tower or to the actual city of Babylon, which, by the way, their major tactic when they would conquer a foreign people would be to exile them into Babylon, and the people would get confused with their own religion and identity, and they would default to Babylonian ideologies and identities. Do you see that going on with the church today internationally? The confusion, the derision, exchanging good doctrine for cultural social pressure that is literally making headway in every country around the world, especially in Europe. In John's, gospel, in John's uh, Revelation, chapter 13, and also 17 and 18, we have clear descriptions of what this whole Babylon-esque world order is going to be, was going to look like in the end times. <clears throat> I'm going to quote Revelation chapter 17. This is just an example, but I want you to see the direct nature of Scripture. Again, what we're, where we're going this morning is, is, is uh, it's a $50,000 fine in, in, in Canada. So for those of you watching from Canada, speak to the hand. I'm in UK. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Having said that, I don't know what your laws are here, but uh, you know what? The check's in the mail, right? Okay. All right. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, this is John, Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Let me just pause there. This is pretty graphic. I mean, don't you think? This is like, ooh, something is not right here. This is, this is the, what the Lord thinks. It gets worse. So he carried me away, verse 3, in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Of course, representing different regions in Europe based on Daniel's prophecy, which we would love to get into, but I want to stay focused. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. She looked great, having her head a golden cup, but full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. One of the markers of this harlot, this Babylon-esque one world, is that they kill believers. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunk, what an image, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. After the church is taken, there will be tons of material and paraphernalia and whatever is left here on earth. The word of God, 144,000 will be raised up. We'll have two witnesses sharing the faith. We'll have an angel heralding it as well. Many Jews will come to faith, especially in the end. That's when all Israel will be saved as it's written, Romans 9 through 11. But many Gentiles will come to faith And in this time period, make no mistake, there will be blood. Unlike today where the church has an influence in the world, it has a restraining property with the Spirit of God. We're in all levels of social strata and civilization. We can impact those around us, advise leadership, and we still have a role even though it's fast deteriorating. Over here in the tribulation, the believers are on the run for their life. They have no place. They've been ousted. Horrible. I want to just throw something at you um, that I think you may find interesting. If you look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it talks about the mark of the beast. This is the marker. This is kind of like the flagship. Do you have your mark? 
And the, the mark is 666, as it says in Greek, or 666. And if you'll notice that that number, it says it explicitly, is the number of man. Now, what's interesting, and this is an observation, and I'm asking you to consider this in your tour with me today, but within Judaism, the power of three establishes an absolute. So, for example, when Peter was confronted, when Jesus was arrested, and somebody says, you are the guy that spent time with him. No, I'm not. And another asked him, and he said, no, yes, you are the guy. And the, the, the third time as well, and he, he complained. That this is, and he swore three times, because in Judaism, three times is an absolute. No, no, no. And that's when they laid off. Notice also that when Jesus was walking with Peter at the very end of John's gospel, he asked him three times, do you love me? And each of the times Jesus was saying, feed my sheep or tend to my lambs. It's almost like Jesus was saying, I'm already in a state of pure forgiveness. I'm giving you a mission. You need to forgive yourself. Think about that. Jesus was saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. I have a mission, a mission, a mission. And the world will get this mark, and it'll say, man, 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 rejecting God. Remember, because the psalm says they, they reject the Lord and his Messiah, and they choose to do it on their own because they think they know better. And God looks down from heaven, and <laughs> isn't that funny? <laughs> that Duplo is, is, is a, it's just off a little bit. And, ah, you know, p- human beings that are working through all of the, the one world order right now, you'll see this in multiple cities around the world. Actually, the most space-age city I've been to is Dubai, ironically, in the Middle East. Let's not forget Singapore. London is up there pretty good, too, but a lot of the cities that are in the West aren't anything to speak of compared to what we see in Asia or even the Middle East. But I could take you to Dubai. I could take you to Singapore. Tokyo, Sydney, London, Paris, New York. And the world thinking will be identical. And I'm going to show you what the world believes, what their good news is to the world, and how people are buying it. But mark my words, it's not going to be God-centric. It's going to be man-centric. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we're warned... We're warned that there would be a change in the last days and people will follow after deceiving doctrines and spirits of many different kinds. And this would be one of the major ones, of course, says the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some, not all, you, you won't. I would like to think you're watchmen today. I would like to think you're aware of the times. You, you, you chose to be here. You could have been at home watching, uh, binge watching on Netflix. You could have. I wouldn't necessarily care if you did, but I'm glad you're here. Spirit especially says the last time some will depart from the faith. Give me heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That just describes the, any politician of any country today. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, we have a list of ideologies and practices that Paul lists that the early church wrote about saying we should see an acceleration of these activities. For example, Irenaeus of Lyons in Against Heresies, book 5, says that we should see an acceleration of Romans 1, 18 through 32. You want to know what Romans 1, 18 through 32 says? Funny you should say. Let's go into it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what, they may be, what, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. The non-believer is aware of God evidence all around so bad that they have to literally choose to turn their face away from it. For, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. 
Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. The birds and the four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who, by the way, is blessed forever. Amen. All right, you ready for the gut punch? For this reason, because they rejected all of this evidence so overtly in the face, like God, God is doing everything he can to say, here I am, and they say, no, we are going to believe the lie. For this reason, because they believed the lie, God gave them up. You want to go that way? Okay. He gave them up to their vile passions for even... Their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. It's no mystery that homosexuality is a hard lifestyle. Um, partners are far less likely to be together than heterosexual couples. We also know that that lifestyle is a magnet for all kinds of diseases that are unique compared to the heterosexual lifestyle. And it is also a benchmark of society of that when you reach that point, because it says, for even their women, it gets so bad that even you come to the point where homosexual lifestyles and sexual confusion really show you the deterioration spectrum of at the very end. You know, we didn't see an embrace of this kind of behavior in human history for a while, for many years until the last probably 50 years. Yeah. Now, it's not only tolerated like it was in the 80s when I was young, and now it's actually encouraged. It's actually now, um, in schools, they're actually wanting, at least in the United States, wanting to keep the sexuality private from the parents of the children lest we get in the way of their self-exploration. Well, it gets, it gets now, now if you think, okay, that's terrible, all of us, every one of us here understands the power of grace because we all bring a sin to the table. It says in verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. I've been, un I've been filled with unrighteousness, sexual immor immorality. I used to do things in my past that were horrible. Wickedness, covetousness, I've coveted things. Maliciousness, I've had mal malice. I've had envy. I've never murdered somebody in my mind I have. Strife, definitely. Deceit, absolutely. Evil-mindedness, yes. Whisperers, yes. Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Does this sound like familiar? Or am I the only one up here that can relate to this? <laughs> Disobedient to parents? Hello. Undiscerning? You ever been fooled by something? Untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. No, nobody here has ever been unforgiving, right? <laughs> For those of you who are married, have you ever had a situation? Unmerciful. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same but also approve those who practice them. That's the key phrase. The world is saying, it's okay to be like this. Whereas you would say, I'm in the fight to not be like this. There are things that I have to say no to every day that are on this list. There are temptations, there are situations that will call out the worst of me, and I have to say no, and I have to say yes to righteousness. But there's been a shift in culture internationally. It's not just in the UK or the United States or Canada. We see it happening all over. It's even happening in Africa, all of Asia. It's happening everywhere. And that is, is that the culture of the world is truly becoming man-centric. I was talking to some African friends of mine from Kenya, and they were saying it's shocking what's going on in Nairobi and Mombasa and different metropolitan areas within Kenya. 
It's so bad, and I want, to, I want to cover the spectrum. How many of you have heard of the Detroit rocker Ted Nugent, who was the rocker of the 70s? Ted Nugent, so one person. Okay, let's put Ted Nugent's face up there. Ted Nugent is an ultra-conservative in the United States. I don't know if he's a believer or not, but he's been noticing the sheer shift, at least in the United States, of the crazy thinking of the list of items we just read in Romans. And he says, welcome to the planet of the apes. That's his phrase. So I'm going to be using that phrase, and that's one of the phrases we use internally, but Ted, you get the credit. It's so bad that we could go all the way to the left now. We, this, Ted Nugent is extreme right. Now we go to the extreme left with Bill Maher of HBO, Home Box Office. And I know, what you, I know you know who, what HBO is. I don't know if you know who Bill Maher is. Bill Maher is an ultra-leftist comedian, and he has this show. He's rather vulgar, and he's on HBO. And he said, uh, recently, he said there's so much change happening, and it's stupidity. He's talking about his own people, ultra-leftist, man-centric people that don't want anything to do with religion. And he's saying... Change is seen as a good thing, but it's not necessarily good. Now I can't tell jokes without offending anybody. Now we've got people playing video games for 14 hours straight and dehydrating and going to the ER. Change is not good. And this is his words. He says, now we're crapping in the kitchen and cooking in the bathroom. Oh, that's change, all right, but it's not good change. These are things they're saying about today's changes. I don't need to even say a word when they're speaking out. Jerry Seinfeld. Have you ever heard of Jerry Seinfeld? You, you, You have people within Hollywood that are saying, it's gone too far, this cancel culture. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not about cancel culture. Canceling is the fruit of what the gospel of the world actually believes. See, they expect everybody to view their message as good news, and those who don't are therefore evil and against their religious system, their their political, socio-religious system, and that person therefore needs to be canceled because they're bad news. They're anti-progress. So we need to get them out of the way. Now, over the next, the last 20 minutes of my tour, I want to put up the BHAP. You say, what is the BHAP? I'm not familiar with that, American. Big, hairy, audacious point. (laughs) In other words, if you get anything, do not miss the BHAP. The BHAP is this. The world has shared beliefs that are universally pushed. You need to understand their so-called gospel if you are to wisely minister in these last days. I'm going to expose it, and I'm going to equip you today. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about the gospel according to the world. There is a ministry in the United States called Focus on the Family. And in the 90s, they had what was called the Truth Project They predicted in the Truth Project that there would be layers of society that would turn and go secular and embrace humanism and reject God and his Messiah, and the church would therefore then become an ignoramus organization of religious people that are misinformed, ignorant, and stupid. They predicted in the Truth Project that levels of society, including art, science, education, and so on, would be hijacked by outright humanism, socialism, and even communism. That it would reject God and dig deep within the hearts of humanity, the talents of humanity, the gifts of humanity, and we could create a utopian environment. And the Truth Project says, the bottom line is, the world will exchange the truth for the lie serving the creation rather than the creator. Which, of course, will trigger neo-paganism. Wiccans will become welcome to the table with their earth worship. There, There should be a movement for green. There should be save the whales and all of these things. And I'm for a lot of this stuff. But even if we were to do everything as a UK and the United States, do you think China's gonna care? Do you think... Other countries are going to care? No. Ironically, that in the millennium, 
everything the world wants right now, they're going to get in actuality. The sad thing is they won't be there to share it. They'll be in hell. That's very sad. That's why I wrote this teaching, so that we can put ourselves back on the aggressive evangelistic offensive against Satan and his lies and, and see people come to the faith. Now, are you ready? $50,000, fine. Well, I could mortgage my house, I guess. But it's worth it. Number one, the gospel according to the world, the foundation is there is no true north. And let me put the picture of the compass up there. Magnetic north disappeared, even though it still exists. They have changed the compass to read anything that feels good to you. Feelings. Okay? You are free to do whatever you want, when you want, with whom you want. Do not let God or his Messiah infringe with these bondage techniques of religion and organized faith. See what they do? They're geniuses, if you look at it. We can define our own reality. You can be anything that you want. And Disney's going to come in with their beautiful music. Today is the day, you know. And they'll sing the beautiful songs, and it'll be emotional, and we'll cry in the theater, and we'll walk out, and we'll realize we've just been sold a lie. Webster's Dictionary of 1828, a very reliable edition, seen as the gold standard, says this. Truth is conformity to fact or reality. Remember, the Truth Project wants you and I to come back to dead center of what the Bible says is true, where there's true freedom. You see, when you know what the truth is, you know where you really stand, and you can deploy what the Bible instructs you to so you can find actual freedom. It's getting pretty bad out there. I don't know how sheltered you are. I was speaking to my small group a few weeks ago, and half of the people in there thought I had just parachuted in from the planet of the apes, a different planet of the apes. Do you realize how bad this whole thing is about identity? We're well beyond sexuality, folks. We're now identifying as animals and creatures and plants. That's how sad this has become. In fact, now the world encourages you to reframe your identity the way you see fit. And there's people to help you along the way. Let me put this uh, picture up. Um, other kin, this is a young teenager, um, actually young 20s, who believes that she's a cat. Okay? And you can see there, when people ask me, how does it feel to be a cat? I'm like... Well, I can say it like this. I'm like, you know, how does it feel to be a human? Okay, I, I know I'm making fun of this, but it is, don't you think this is kind of funny? She actually believes she's a cat. And so here I am, I'm sitting in my, my small group for my church, and I'm talking about this, and one guy says to me, I've never heard of that. Well, then it must not exist if you've never heard of it. I don't want you to be ignorant. And then what? Last week, last week, in the school system of a city not far from me, one of the girls is complaining to leadership that she feels like they don't understand her because she's a cat. Right there. And my buddy sees this. He's like, well, maybe, Mike, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe people are starting to, to identify as other things. I'm only using this as one example. If you go out into the real world and you travel and get out into the cities and even get into homes, what you see when people driving on the freeways here and on the ways, everybody kind of complies to the societal laws. But do you really know what's going on inside houses? What people are doing? What they're thinking about themselves? So I played a joke on my own church. This is horrible. <laughs> if, if you know me, I'm, I like taking risks. So I walk into the youth group, and if you're a parent, you can't really sit in the youth group. It's really designed for the parents or the uh, volunteer parents that are there. 
So they said, hey, Mike, and I was the pastor of this church for 17 years, so, you know, they're kind of tolerating me, and they said, well, since you're not a student, you really can't check in. Um, What are your plans? I said, well, I identify as a 15-year-old tonight, so I'm going to just come in. And since I identify as a 15-year-old, I am going to play with all the other 15-year-olds. And they, they laughed at me. <laughs> they thought it was funny. And that's exactly the reaction that I wanted because it's absurd. You may laugh. I may laugh. The, the world would say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Although, although you kind of are gray, and have lines and crow's feet around your eyes, you know, maybe some creams could solve that, Mr. Golay. Uh, But welcome. If you identify as a 15-year-old, we're not going to stop you. Now, we're changing reality to a lie, and the lie becomes a reality. I want to encourage you, and some of you love Hebrew. Even if you don't know Hebrew, I'm going to just stand off to the side here, and I'm going to show you the root, the source of reality and existence itself, God invented. In the Bible, I want to introduce you to the word to be. Past tense, haya in Hebrew. You can see that right up there with the letters. Haya means was. The Hebrew word for is, present tense, is hove. You can see, even though you don't know Hebrew necessarily, you can see the, the letters look very similar, except the middle one. In the middle section, you'll have a longer one versus the top and the bottom. That's called a vav, and there's yuds on the top and bottom. And then for the future tense, you just add a yud on the right side, which is ie, which means will be. Haya, hove, ie, was, is, and will be. Study the Hebrew carefully. That's the name of God. Isn't that cool? Yahweh literally means was, is, and will be. You want reality? You want truth? He is truth and reality. He was, he is, and he always will be. You cannot escape it. You cannot redefine it. You cannot run from it because it will always be, and it will always be in the future. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. Moses said to God, he's scared. Who Who sent me? What credentials will I have? Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they will say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, in Hebrew. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. There it is. You read Hebrew, you're gonna, that's what you're going to get. Now, in the Jewish community, they would say, but of course, this is very, uh, we learned it in school, there's nothing new. But let's face it, as filthy pig-eating Gentiles like you and I, we could use a little bit of Hebrewization, right, to understand the scriptures. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, look what it says there. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is an exact truth representation of God himself, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, because he is. He is. He is existence itself. And so the first thing about the gospel according to the world is that they will change to true north and recalibrate your compass, but you don't let them. You don't let them do that. Second thing that you're going to expect to see more of is if it feels right, do it. Follow your heart. You'll hear all kinds of songs like that. If it feels good, explore it, do it. I struggle with this as much as the next guy, but then there comes time to do a reality check. 
Look, emotions are a high motivator to make somebody act in an immediate sense. And marketing schematics understand this with some of the music and some of the graphics that they use, some of the testimonials that they use. I get it. I get it. But many of us here will be fooled. The world has been fooled. The world will have wonderful movies and will sell all kinds of ideologies through music, have been forever. You ever caught yourself singing a tune and you're like, wait, what did I just sing? You ever caught yourself? Am I the only reprobate in the room? I don't know. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me like, no, no, we, we never can't relate to that. I only sing Christian songs, okay? <laughs> when I get to be as mature as you, maybe then I will, okay. Abortion, for example. A woman comes in, she's very confused doesn't know what to do. She goes to what we call Planned Parenthood in the United States. Nice sticker tag, Planned Parenthood. Ooh, makes it look like it's something responsible, you know. Little do they know, they've just walked in to a murder factory. And the nurse puts her arm around her. Oh, it's going to be just fine. What's your heart telling you? Well, my boyfriend said I should get rid of this baby because it's a financial burden on us and it was an unplanned thing. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you to Dr. Shurrakbak, who is from, uh, well, no, we won't go in there, some of my crazy jokes. He, he is well-skilled in the arts, and he will take care of you. And then the woman goes through that process. It's all based on feelings. Over here, a woman comes in who wants to keep her baby, and the doctor comes in and says, here's an ultrasound of your baby. The heart is beating well. It's a boy. Can you see that? Yes, I can. That's so cool. And have you had a, pre, a, a, a pre-parenting class at all? Because you're going to need to think about all of the responsibilities. That go- They're dealing with facts. Over here, feelings. Make the decision based on the fear of the future. The responsibilities you don't know what to do with. And as an example, this woman over here, came to me years ago as a pastor, and she said, I feel like I need to do this. I said, please don't kill your baby. She said, well, my boyfriend wants me to do it. Is he going to make all the decisions for your life? Is he going to stand before God? It's your conscience, not his. She struggled with this for several weeks. I had a whole prayer team praying for her. There were hundreds of people praying for her. She calls me one day. She says, I went in. My my husband drove me, my boyfriend drove me, and I got sick. And they said, we cannot do this procedure because you're too sick. She comes back after a few weeks. I have two families in the church that come forward, and they give exorbitant amounts of money and say, give this to this woman. Let's smash this fear of financial fear for her future. We took away every excuse. By the way, the baby was born, and it's a healthy little boy. Yeah, isn't that cool? Now, I'm going to shotgun through this in the next 10 minutes. The world's gospel. So, we know that True North is uh, taken off. The compass doesn't mean anything. And we also know feelings are going to be a huge driver of decisions. Now, I want to look at what they actually believe and what they're selling you, all in the name of of stuff they got from Jewish, Judeo-Christian values. Look what they've done. They are evil geniuses, okay? Here's the world's gospel. First of all, I want to put a picture up here. This is a pavilion in Abu Dhabi that they're proposing to build, and this is the Abrahamic one God faith, the monotheistic gods. There is a Christian church, a Jewish synagogue, and a Muslim mosque, all in the name of what I referred to earlier as the coexist bumper sticker. In order to make this happen, each of these faiths have to delete certain sections of their theology to make them less exclusive and more compatible with kind of an interfaith ecumenicalism. So in other words, they have to depart from what they believe and move in a different direction, driven by different values of a one religion. And we see that happening in Islam. We see that happening in Israel. 
There was a day when the Orthodox Jews had way more power over the people than they do now. Israel's mostly secular, if you ask me, in my, in my view. You can ask Amir later what he thinks. But because we are one, we should have open borders. If you Christians are so compassionate, why wouldn't you want open borders? You see what they're doing? They're taking your value, twisting it, and then throwing back at you and their application of open borders. Well, wait a minute. They're asking you as the church to take, to ta- they're asking to take a church value and apply it to the government where now we have open borders and we don't know who's who, we don't know who's good, we don't know who's bad. The job of the government is to enforce justice and to execute justice on the evildoer, Romans 13. So what they've done is they've hijacked the principle of compassion and empathy, repackaged it, and made you feel guilty that you are against open borders. But see, if you're a one-world government, there's nothing to worry about because we're all just intrinsically good. But that's a lie. We see that that's not the case. Next, sexual malleability. Huge, huge, huge. It's not only the new reality, it's now the new major cause. Think about the black community from the 60s until now, at least in Brazil, United States, and Canada. I can't can't say anything about UK because I don't know. But they've been fighting for the perception that they want an equality, whether it's feelings or fact-based. We can argue that all day long, but that's how they feel. And now, within just a year, the LGBTQRSD4 divided by 5, 6 is now having their own month. They now get everything they want, carte blanche. And our black friends are sitting here going, wow, it took us 20 years and more and we're still fighting. And you guys got everything on a buffet table handed to you. Hmm. Because this is not really about equality. It's about an agenda. Sexual malleability will become more and more of an issue in these last days. And I want to send a very clear message to you that I sent in Canada. I have homosexual friends. I have this community confiding in me when things get rough. And I consider it an honor they come to me rather than somebody else in their own camp that's even worse confused. They know they're going to get reality from me, even if it hurts, but they also know something else. They're also going to get compassion and love of Jesus. And I'm going to compel them every time to latch on to Jesus because I know that that's the only true salvation for any of us. I say the same thing to someone who is an alcoholic. I say the same thing for somebody who is a sex addict. I say the same thing for somebody who is a narcissist that cannot stop worshiping themselves. I say the same thing to anybody struggling with any sin because I say the same to myself and I have to wake up every morning and I have to say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. Give me the strength to cling to you all day long to resist sin and to do that which you've called me to do. You know, John Hopkins University, non-believers, they used to do reassignment surgeries, but they got a conscience, and they said, we can't do it anymore because we're increasing the suicide rate and the depression rate and the, 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 the mental health rate of all of these people that have reassignment surgeries. So they stopped. But then because of the political pressure, the social pressure, in the last few years, they were mandated to do them again. How would you like to work in that institution, one of the greatest medical institutions that the United States has to offer? And it's so bad that even communities like Dave Chappelle, who tell jokes about the sheer chaos of these communities, which many of the people in these communities think are funny, because they genuinely are, has now been canceled as a comedian on most channels. Dave Chappelle is not a believer. Mother Earth. Save the earth. Climate change. We need to stop it. Ozone layer in Antarctica. Paper straws are the solution. (laughs) Electric vehicles in London. 20 quid to enter the city. Five quid this month to just drop someone off at the airport. Oh yeah, it's coming. 
Mother Earth. We as Christians are stewards of the earth. We should be the people that don't litter, that don't pollute. I will confess I dumped oil down the storm drain when I was young after I changed my oil, but I never did it after that. Okay? But you look at some of the pagan religions from the inception of the ancient Near East, they've always worshipped earth, earth worship, Wiccans do that. But now it's really become a policy of governments. And I, I, I hope you hear me correctly. If you like an electric car, go buy one. They're faster than gasoline cars. They're extremely exhilarating, especially when you give it the berries. Whoa, yeah, it's really fun. But if you think, if we think we can save the earth when the Bible predicted that it is eagerly groaning for its own redemption and will only get worse, then let's be good stewards, but let's focus on the souls of humanity. But the world does not know that. They think that if we come together and save the earth, we can pat ourselves on the back as Babylon residents and feel good about ourselves and even worship ourselves with the earth. Woke culture. Woke culture, really, that took off in the United States, and it's, gonna re it's rewriting history. It's rewriting values. The United States Constitution is, what, is, is written by white, gray-haired men with roots from this country. So you're, we blame you. It's your fault, okay? Uh, don't let the world redefine what you own. The Bible the apostles, and the Lord define true racial equality. Think about that. At the cross, there's neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, man or woman, etc. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. The world is saying, no, 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 no. We're not equal before the cross. We're equal if you follow our curriculum. Don't be fooled. Don't let the world take what is yours. That is part of the gospel according to the world. You're going to see more of that, by the way. One world government. This is what we talked about earlier. All I want to say about this is expect more of a financial oneness through cryptocurrency. Expect more of a spiritual oneness as people give up exclusivity within their faiths and gut their faiths out for the sake of fitting in with the rest of the world, which is really compromise. It's really selling your soul to the devil, if you ask me. And political. I think that the world is shocked mostly with this Russian invasion of Ukraine because they didn't think with all the work they put into globalization this could ever happen with an evil nationalist agenda to take over a country for resources without any conscience and leave bodies on the ground in all the streets that they left for dead. And so this war, if anything, will accelerate the need for the world to keep going towards a one-world government, saying, oh, we haven't done a good enough job. Look, and they'll talk among themselves, we've failed. Look, if this can happen, then we've got a lot more work to do. So they're going to only accelerate their agenda because of this. Lastly, and there are many more, but I'm going to leave, leave some time here. Um, I dare not take more than I, want, than I, than I was given. Neopaganism. Neopaganism, especially in the UK, if you're not aware, has really taken off the last 20 to 30 years. Neopaganism is a form of Satanism, and they'll have the same symbols, they'll have the pentagram, they'll have different jewelry, different tattoos. You'll see this especially in London. London is one of the epicenters of neopaganism. It's borrowing ancient Near East religions, cooking them into a soup, and then being excited about wearing certain aspects. This is also true of the Nordic gods, a Revival of the Greek and Roman gods. There's a renewed interest in the ancient Near East religions, and they're cooking them the way they feel they should be. So even somebody who represented, let's just say, a Nordic god would come today of somebody that worships Odin in his backyard and say, man, that's really messed up. We used to worship Thor, and you're worshiping uh, this, 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 we don't even know what that is. Is that the Walmart version or the Marvel version? We're really confused. You may, you may smile, but there was a guy at my base in the United States Air Force. He came in for a beard waiver. You can't have beards in the military unless you have waivers. He says, I worship Odin and Thor. And I said, okay, sit down. He sat down. 
I said, look, they had just released the new Marvel movie with Thor. I said, it sounds like you're a Marvel fan. Oh, no, I have an altar to Odin in my backyard. Okay. Well, he didn't get a waiver. Um, But in his world, and he's just an example of many, that are going back to paganism, and that's why we call it neopags, and it's paganism reinvented. It's very popular. Are you aware of this? I don't know. I mean, some of you are looking at me blank eyes like, I, I haven't seen that. Pay attention. Now, I'm going to leave you with three applications. Of course we could talk more. You could say, Mike, you should include other things as well. You should include the politics and where we're going specifically with politics and education. You should talk about education. You should talk about other world religious systems and what they're doing to advance. Well, that's for a different day. I wanted to give you a snapshot that the the world wants to become one. You're in the way, and they're going to blame you, and now I want to put you on the offensive. And if you listen to my last three points, you can do that. In In these last days, believers must do at least these three things. First of all, you need wisdom. The Bible says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God, and he'll give freely to those who ask. In humility. How do you get wisdom? Well, besides the obvious of hanging around people that are older than you, learning from other people's experiences, reading, there is a book in the Bible that is chock full of wisdom. It's like wisdom syrup that you have to mix with water it's that concentrated. It's the Proverbs. Look what it says, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And then I'm going to challenge you. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple. I'm, I'm a simple guy. I could use more wisdom. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What if? Application number one. Today is April 2nd, right? What if you read two Proverbs today and one for the whole rest of the month of April? There's 31 Proverbs. There's respectively 31 days generally in a month. How many days are there this month, just out of curiosity? There's 30? Okay. You read a proverb a day, basically. Imagine how your mind would be conditioned after April. See, I live in the real world, and so do you. And so if you want wisdom, you have to go after it. One, you have to pray and ask God. And then two, I invite you to go to the Proverbs and join me in getting concentrated wisdom coming through your ears every morning. Can you imagine that much wisdom? Because then you'll be able to read situations. You'll be able to discern. You'll be able to dial in solutions for everyone around you. And there will be people coming to you saying, can I ask you a question? I see that you make good decisions. Can you give me some advice? Number two, especially now, prioritize community. You came today, you could have been in 14 other places, you made the decision. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says this, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. When you come to events like this and to church, you don't come only to get, you come to give. You come to pray for people. You come to encourage people. You have conversations with people. You drink coffee with people. They do the same to you. It's iron sharpening iron. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Those are losers. Literally, they're losing an opportunity. Not in the sense of the immaculate loser. It's more of you're literally losing. What? But exhorting one another so much more as you see the day. Second coming. Approaching. There's a connection with meeting, the urgency to meet, the urgency to be together as believers, especially in the last days, to sharpen each other. Go to church. 
Take friends. To, I came to church on a dare. I had, con, I had been out sinning one night. Basic vandalism, throwing rocks at newspaper stands at 70 miles per hour. It's very difficult, by the way. If you ever try, don't try, because that's something that could get you in trouble. But I, that's what I did. My friend said, I can't stand myself anymore. I'm going to church the next morning. And I said, yeah, right. If you go to church, I will go to church with you, because I thought he was just giving me molarkey. Hopefully that's not a swear word here in UK, molarkey. And he picked me up, and then the next week I got saved from Adair. The, la- the last thing before I get off this stage, learn to transfer the dilemma back to the people that accuses you of the absurdity. If they want to frame you as an evil person for non-open borders, if they want to say, you're not about women's rights, don't let them get away with it. Paul didn't. Look at this. Acts chapter 22, verse 23 through 29. And they listened to him until his word, until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. They're talking about the apostle Paul. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered them to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. He needs to understand his crime. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, uh, excuse me, can I, can I just ask a question? This is the ultimate dilemma transfer. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? I'm just asking because I'm Roman. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then he, the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. Yes, I am. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained, for a large sum I paid for this citizenship. And Paul said, I was born that way. <laughs> then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. I already gave you the tale of two pregnant women. When you talk to somebody struggling, transfer the dilemma and say, if over here it's fetal tissue, non-believers, and over here, non-believers, It's a baby that you should be excited about who's a little baby boy. Here's what dilemma transfer looks like. Is it tissue or is it a baby? Which is it? Let people squirm in reality. Force reality before them so that they have a dilemma. That is the arena where the Spirit of God can work. Where they've rejected the Bible already. Appeal to God in reality, for the Spirit of God will work. Here's another one for you. A lot of people are becoming secular. I'm going to end with this. I promise. I was talking to the taxi driver on the way from Heathrow to my hotel yesterday. He was complaining about how the world has changed. He brought it up, not me. And uh, I said to him, look, you know, the secular person... If the secular person is right and we die and we really don't know where we're going or, or, or that's it, we just go to the grave, is accusing me of being too religious. If he's right and I'm wrong, I at least live a happy life, deceived in his mind, but I'm living a happy life and we both share the same fate. It's a wash. This is the dilemma. This is the dilemma. This, I'd say, why would you risk your soul? If, if the Bible's right... And you're wrong. I die and I go to heaven and everything I believed on earth was 100% right. But you are gambling with your soul. Either way, in either scenario, I win. You're betting your soul 50% on a bet that's very dangerous. Why would you do that? Would you at least not look into the claims of Jesus? What do you do about the resurrection? Produce a body to me. People have made excuses for the lack of a body for 2,000 years. Produce a body. You see what I'm doing? It's dilemma transfer. When you get wisdom 
and you have your unique situations with family and friends, God will give you what to say in an attitude of love, compassion, but also of forthcoming and assertiveness. We live in the last days. Throughout the day, you're going to see how much more true that is. Let's all stand. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you people prioritized their day to come out here and listen to teachings. We pray right now that you would envelop this room with wisdom, commitment to our communities, and allow us, Father, effective ways to evangelize those who need to know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Amen.